Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate oh. or good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, appreciate everybody joining today. Um, we've got a, a great panel of folks here to, uh, to contribute to uh, our discussion about where connectivity, compute, IoT, and use cases come alive at the uh, Future Technologies Innovation Center. Um, so excited about today's panel. Uh, so uh, just to introduce the panel, uh, uh, Peter Cappiello, CEO of Future Technologies. Uh, we have Gary Hill, who is the Vice President of Future Technologies, who's going to be leading some of the live demos today. Um, we have Vipesh Agarwal from Intel uh, joining us today to talk about the, uh, the ecosystem and private networks. Uh, we have Ben Sellers joining us from LibreStream to talk about remote worker. Uh, Cambium Networks is represented by Bruce Collins, who's going to talk to us about Cambium Networks in the uh, digital oil field space. Uh, we also have uh, Mike Danielak from Skyward on to talk about their uh, drone management platform and drone use in, in the uh, digital oil field. Uh, from uh, Nokia, we have Jaime Laguno uh, joining us, who's the global head of uh, the oil and gas vertical. So appreciate him joining. And we also have uh, Sierra Wireless joining uh, by way of Brent Christensen, who is a lead field service engineer for uh, Sierra Wireless. So, you know, great panel today. Uh, apologies for the uh, the IT setup at the beginning, but I think we'll be uh, we'll, we'll be going in the right direction now. Um, just a quick background on future technologies. We're a lead system integrator. We do a bunch of work across the energy uh, vertical market. Uh, I think some of our our clients are on here. We appreciate them uh, joining today, um, but. Uh, Again, we're a lead system integrator. The goal today is to focus more on innovation and uh, digital transformation. Um, we have a six step approach to client engagement. Yeah. Today, we're gonna focus on our innovation center, which is step two, where we do a lot of use case uh, incubation, technology demonstrations, interoperability testing, um, and technical workshops. So uh, the, the goal today is to uh, focus on that area of, of overlap with our ecosystem partners. And we're also gonna be demonstrating some use cases beyond just the technology. We'll have some edge compute, some connectivity, and ultimately uh, we're gonna be demonstrating use cases today uh, live uh, from the Innovation Center. Uh, this is a high level overview of, of, of the facility in Atlanta, Georgia. So we have a, a customer briefing room, a network operations center, edge compute lab, a couple uh, demonstration towers, and then ultimately we have center stage where we're uh, bringing the use cases to life over with the uh, edge compute and also the connectivity. Hey, thanks, Pete. So, hey, we're going to do a quick tour of our innovation center here in Atlanta. Again, we've set this up to demonstrate uh, advanced connectivity with Wi-Fi, private cellular, C and wave from CAM, and as well as a lot of use cases. So we'll just do a quick tour here of the facility, give you a sense of it. So we're starting here in the front of the house. We have a uh, compute room here where we do our edge computing. So uh, here we're running kind of the, the edge compute for the private network. We're also running an Intel Nook for our computer model, computer vision models. Uh, we also have an Inspur uh, server rack running Intel. We're also running computer vision models here. And um, we also work with the hyperscaler. So here's an Azure edge stack. So uh, AWS, Azure, we, you know, we, we work with the hyperscalers. Some people are on things at the edge and in the cloud. We also have a distributed SDAS here in the building. So again, a lot of edge compute. We also have, you know, pretty robust connectivity out to the internet, into the cloud services, into the applications from, from here. So let's go uh, look at quickly just the network monitoring room. So we are, we're able to monitor the networks we have here in the innovation center through a couple of panes of glass. Here's just some examples. So again, you know, monitoring your networks is very important. So we can show and demo the tools to our customers for that as well. Let's go actually hit now the industrial space. So this is about 8,500 square feet of kind of warehouse industrial space that we've taken and created kind of a working demo environment for connectivity and use cases. So we're gonna start here in the back where we built a tower. So we have two of these, one here in the front of the building. We also have a another tower in the back that we're basically doing connectivity. So if you go up the tower, on the right-hand side, you can see that's an Nokia NDAC um, Pico cell. We're running CBRS. On the right-hand side, left-hand side is a Cambium uh, Wi-Fi. So we can run Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6 on that. At the very top, you see a Cambium uh, running. That's a C and Wave product, basically running Terragraph, which is a 
high speed wireless interconnect. So we were running high speed between the towers to de demonstrate that as well. And just here's a couple of uh, more antennas that you would do in an outdoor kind of private cellular environment. And these are not live, but again, these are more ruggedized, much more powerful for kind of an outdoor use case. Hey, while we're here too, let's take a peek at uh, these are portable lab systems. So we build these for a lot of clients who want to try out uh, private networking. Uh, these are basically this, this first one is basically two cases. You have your radio network and your um, software, uh, basically private edge core running. So we can ship this to a customer, ship them a couple Pico cells, and it can quickly be up and running kind of a private network in their innovation lab. Uh, and they're in manufacturing. So again, it's a quick way to go test private wires. Here's a bottom uh, configuration where everything's in one cabinet. So again, these can be shipped to you. Um, we're getting a lot of demand in the market for people wanting to try private cellular connectivity. So go ahead and walk through the rest of the center. So you can see we have a robot here at AMR that we, we brought online today. This is running on Wi-Fi. In Q1, we're working with Nokia and Mir, the, the robotics vendor, to put this on our private network, uh, put it on the Nokia index. So again, the a place to experiment, try new types of connectivity uh, for all these end use cases. So let's kind of move down further into the innovation center here. Uh, on the left hand side, these are portable cellular networks that we're building for military use cases. So these get deployed out onto a military base, 4G, 5G private network can be totally self-contained. Basically it has the power generation, the network core, everything self-contained. So Again, this is where we're manufacturing these here in the, in the innovation center to kind of give more of an industrial feel. So let's also hit center stage here. We'll, we'll come back to this later, but this is where we have use cases set up for demoing, have a conveying system here on the left for some computer vision. We have other use cases on the center stage that we'll demo later um, and also have an industrial vibration sensing uh, solution over here on the right. So, Center stage, this is again a brief tour. We bring people to here physically or virtually like today. So uh, look forward to sharing some demos with you later on in the uh, webinar. Pete, I'll turn it back over to you. No problem. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Bhupesh Agarwar. I'm the director of private networks and edge computing at Intel. And in this section, we are gonna talk about three things. What is a private network? What are the three layers of private network? and why the collaboration around uh, around this innovation center is really important. Like given the different technologies, different solutions, everyone is bringing together to deliver a turnkey solution for the end customers. So next slide, please. When we look at the enterprises now, like they primarily have, they primarily have two, solution the connectivity solution on the one side they have the LAN right we all know that LAN has mobility issues but many people do not know that LAN is very costly right based on the surveys that we have done in last two years with some of our uh, tier one and tier two customer LAN costs almost 100 to 200 dollar on a per foot basis so it's a pretty significant investment when we are looking at uh, some big deployments on the other hand, when we look at the mobility, we know that mobility, especially Wi-Fi, it has the reliability issues, it has the bandwidth issues, it has the coverage issues, and also it also depends on the the building type, right, or the or the construction type, whether it's a glass, whether it's motor, and all. So there are lots of challenges in the mobility. What the enterprises are really looking for is the reliability, what they are getting from LAN, and the uh, and, and the flexibility and the mobility of a Wi-Fi in the form of a multi-access solution. Multi-access means in some use cases, it will have the cellular connectivity and Wi-Fi. And in some cases, it will be purely, they want to move to the cellular network, which gives them the uh, right kind of reliability and mobility. So next slide, please. Now, everyone talks about private network these days, but if we look at from the very high level standpoint, you can divide the private network in three different layers. One is what we call the network infrastructure layer. This includes the RAN side, the radio access network side. It includes the edge side, like what uh, Gary talked about, right? um, edge computing. It, uh, it includes the packet core, and it also includes the cloud infrastructure. 
Now, one of the challenges that, especially in the energy sector, is about the backhaul that uh, many people do not understand, given that it's not only the fiber connectivity to the cloud, it also, in some cases, where the fiber connectivity is not there, then you have to rely on even the satellite connectivity. The second layer is about the virtual network functions like SD-WAN, firewalls, and all. And the third uh, layer, which is equally important, and in fact, in the case of private network, private network starts with a enterprise use case, right? So unlike the public network where everything starts with a network deployment, private network starts with the enterprise asking like, hey, I have a problem of this particular use case. I want to solve it. How do I solve it? Can, can the private network can help me out? So this third layer of IoT applications and the IoT devices is equally important. So anytime, like when you look at any private network or anybody is talking to you about the private network, think about from these three layers standpoint and you will have a pretty good clarity on what's happening, who is bringing what and all. So next slide, please. Now, in the, in the previous slide, I talk about uh, those three layers. But as you can see, when you decompose that those three layers, you see that there are lots of in individual components, right? Like I talk about endpoint devices. There is a spectrum, especially in the case of private network, right? Because whether in, if, we, if you're talking about uh, in the US, it's CBRS. But if you talk about globally, right, the more and more governments are opening up the spectrum. Uh, radio access network, edge compute, packet core, cloud services, virtual network functions, enterprise applications, backhaul that I talk about, the overall architecture, because the architecture is different based on the use case uh, or the based on the enterprise requirements. And then, like what Gary and Pete were talking about, about the deployments and the managed services, because most of the time, like uh, when you look at the Wi Fi in the LANs, kind of connectivity, the enterprise's IT department is pretty well worth uh, supporting those ones. But what we are noticing is the IT teams of these enterprises do not have any exposure around the cellular technology. And this is where when the enterprises are deploying private networks, they are relying on system integrators like future technologies to make sure that it's not only the right deployment, but also it's a long-term supportable model so that they get the full support with all the KPIs and all that they have in mind. So all these variables, they are interconnected. You can't miss them, but it also brings a big question about like different stakeholders who are gonna come and provide the end-to-end -end solution, starting from the endpoint devices, just like what Skyward is doing, or the backhaul, what KBM is doing, the Nokia's index solution, uh, future tax, uh, overall system integration. This is where the collaboration, this collaboration around the innovation center is important. So if you go to the next slide, please. And this is, as I said, like this is where we are very excited about this innovation center because what we are doing is we are bringing all these uh, partners together. We are putting the solutions together, right? Future Tech is putting so much of um, investment and resources here, but before it goes to your premise, when they deploy it, everything will be tested out in the lab here. Everything will be optimized to your requirements and KPI, to meet your KPIs. And everyone, everything will be fully supported by the leaders here like Skyward, Cavium, Intel, and other Sierra Wireless and all. So this is what you're gonna get out of this innovation center. You can be pretty sure that uh, the, the, the target performance targets that you have will be clearly met. And from Intel side, these will be uh, these will be as Gary was showing, right? Some of those servers which are Intel-based servers. So all these applications and everything will be optimized running on um, Intel architecture. So this is uh, where we are excited, and I'm going to give it back to Pete to talk about the next section. Hey, Bapesh, that's that's great. Thank you very much for uh, the, the presentation. Glad we got the uh, the slides going. Appreciate Jaime stepping in and helping us out. Uh, the, the next uh, portion of this, we're going to do a few slides on uh, LeverStream, which has a remote worker application that we're using in the Innovation Center. Um, okay, thank you everybody for, for joining today and, and thank you for uh, bearing with us through the, through the slides. Um, so 
Quick introduction to myself. Again, Pete mentioned this. I'm a global account manager here at LibreStream. I work alongside Future Tech and really trying to join together not only our technologies, but bringing in the different components of what Future Tech has to, has to offer to make a more holistic solution uh, for their customer base. Um, so to give a quick overview of, of LibreStream, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, we, we truly try to sit, we sit within the AR and AI uh, environment. I'm going to talk more about where we truly fit, but we've been in business since 2003. Uh, when doing your research across the market, you'll notice that a lot of the companies in the ecosystem really started popping up around 2012 to 2016. So in that long time frame from the very beginning, we, we had a lot of lessons learned about the nuances of the market and where we can truly uh, find scale. Um, so since then, we've been rated by many different market researchers as the number one remote AR solution um, in, in the world um, and currently doing business in 120 different countries. There is a slide, there's a, a note there that a lot of our customer base really resides inside of that Fortune 2000 uh, list. But since COVID had started, we have seen a massive explosion within the mid-market uh, um, business as well. So uh, a lot of exciting things changing and, and, and helping to kind of enable this, this uh, digital workforce uh, to move along quicker. Next slide, please. So the, the, to a lot of people, the kind of the forgotten side of why we need stuff like remote expert assistance, digital work instructions in the field, that, you know, 80% of the workforce is not behind a desk, right? So that's where we sit. So when we think of Zoom and Teams and WebEx and all these different tools, uh, that people think are ubiquitous to needing to collaborate, they are thinking in terms of PowerPoints or we're having a face-to-face -face meeting or something like that. But when you're on top of a tower, when you're in on an oil rig, when you are, uh, you know, underneath a bulldozer in the middle of the Congo, there are much bigger uh, challenges. There's different functionalities needed, and there's different tools that we need to be able to provide at that point. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're trying to do is really create what we call a knowledge network. And, and I, you know, again, we get constantly the question of, well, can I just pop up Teams? Can I pop up, you know, Zoom or, or FaceTime or whatever? And, and the knowledge network, network concept really helps to kind of bring this to light of what we're trying to do. It's not about just dialing in and me showing you what my issue is. I do need to do that. Uh, but when I'm in the field, I need to be able to capture what's happening. I need to be able to work alongside our backend systems to analyze what the issue is or with a subject matter expert that could be across the world. I need to deliver back that solution that could be not only from that subject matter expert, but it could come from an older service ticket. It could come from reference videos that we're creating in a training lab, anything. And then the biggest piece of it that is really becoming the biggest issue is preserving that data. Uh, preserving what happened and being able to act on that again later. As we all know, and we're probably feeling the pains of every single day, you have over 10,000 baby boomers a day retiring. Then statistically speaking, you have millennial workforce coming in that is going to leave that next job within the next three years as well. So not only are we needing to grab as much tribal knowledge from, that, uh, from those subject matter experts that are leaving, we have a shorter time frame of when to work through a KPI that we really try to monitor, which is time to competency. How quickly can I get a new technician or somebody that is needing uh, you know, to be able to interact with this field workforce? How much quicker can I get them to do their job at scale and then understand how to capture their knowledge again and go to the next, um, to, you know, to that next service uh, tech that may be coming in to do that job. Uh, next slide, please. So a high level overview of really the platform, then we're gonna hand it over to Gary to dive into some, some real world examples. But you know, our core piece of the platform is, is remote expert assistance. And that's what most people know LibreStream for. Uh, that's part of what you'll see in the demonstration today. So I won't go too far in depth there. We also have a digital work instruction tool, which is highly powerful for training new technicians, standardizing your workflows in the field, you know, capturing and analyzing what's truly happening at each point, you know, which steps took longer, where could we improve, where can we be more efficient, um, and then being able to capture that in, in a knowledge preservation and, and either send that back to your backend systems via API, hold it within our secure, um, you know, cloud storage as well, or whatever it is that kind of gets you to that next level of digitization. 
Um, we have multiple different advanced capabilities uh, ranging from natural language processing, being able to speak to somebody in real time in almost 30 different languages and growing. So I can be across the world speaking to somebody, uh, you know, in Japan and in Germany and France, everybody's hearing uh, me talk to them in, in their native tongue uh, directly through the platform in real time. You can use tools that, that Gary already mentioned, like computer vision and OCR or optical character recognition. So a lot of power that you can grab if you already have these pro programs in flight or you need to lean on somebody like Future Tech to help you scale those uh, advanced capabilities up. This is where you really get to utilize a platform like this as the lens and the conduit to deliver that actually at the edge. And some of the most important things that don't get talked about enough is really how do you scale this out? You need a wide range of devices to be able to use it on. You need to be able to use it in many different environments. You're not always going to have great uh, signals, um, you know, out in the middle of nowhere or, or in, you know, kind of in the middle of a shop, you know, or the back corner of a shop. Uh, but then also, how do we actually do this in the most secure way? Uh, so again, given that we've been around for so long, we've learned lessons of what the biggest and the best in the industry need for security protocols. And on that note, we won't be beat. Uh, so for, let me hand it over to Gary. He'll kind of do a quick demonstration of the platform. And obviously, I'll stick around uh, for Q&A as well. Hey, thanks, Mid. I appreciate that. Uh, so if we could uh, stop the desktop sharing. Great. So hey, we're going with a quick demo of the LibreStream platform. Again, as been mentioned, LibreStream has been around for a number of years. They've really matured the platform uh, using global companies all over the world. So today we're going to do just a, a, some foundational demos. So I've got an iPad here. LibreStream software runs on an iPad. It runs on a Windows 10 machine, which we're showing back here. Uh, it also runs on iPhones, Androids, and it also runs on, so this is a more advanced use case of a LibreStream hands-free headset of a, a real world HMT1. So we're going to do a quick demo. I want to hand this off to Roger. So this is this is running on our private network. So this is a, an iPad running on CBRS. So Roger's going to take this into the server room. I'm going to kind of do a demo of helping him through kind of a, a, a service order that he got. Uh, I'm running basically off of a Windows 10 PC here on Wi-Fi. So again, we're trying to show the flexibility of the connectivity. Uh, it's been mentioned though, hey, you know, a lot of places do have very connectivity, Wi-Fi, maybe a private network. Um, but LibreStream uh, also runs on low bandwidth. So uh, as been mentioned, not every place has great connectivity. So I think one of their claims to fame is, hey, when you're in a scenario that has poor connectivity, uh, I still can get a connection. I can still do a remote worker session, uh, which is gonna be much more challenging on a, on a product like a Zoom or a team. So anyway, let's step into the demo, have Aussie come over here and we'll show you the screen. So this is the Windows 10 interface here for the LibreStream product. I have basically a directory here of people I can call. Um, I have controls here. Hey, we're gonna, we can record this meeting. So think about it has been mentioned for training and knowledge transfer. Anytime I'm doing a remote connection session, I can record the thing as a video. It stores in their cloud platform. All the photographs and things that I take during this session will be stored as well. So I'm gonna give Roger a call. Um, try to help Roger through uh, a, a ticket. Hey, Gary. Hey, Roger, good morning, thank you. So we're seeing what Roger's seeing. Roger's on that iPad or our CBS network. He's in our um, computer room back there. Uh, basically, I'm gonna take a high resolution image of what Roger just showed me. Um, I'm gonna share that back with him. So there we are. So now we're both working off this high res image. I can still see Roger's live video here, uh, but it's much easier to work off of a still image. So again, this is getting saved in the platform. Um, one of the great things too, instead of just talking about this and seeing it, I have the, the annotation capability. So I can basically show Roger, this is the cable that we're gonna to need to move and we're gonna to need to repatch that cable from there up to this port here. So I can annotate here, I can draw circles, squares, I can draw lines. So again, no, no question as we're collaborating kind of how I can help Roger uh, remotely. Roger can also annotate on his end. So, hey, Roger, would you confirm kind of where we're going to repatch that cable just so we're, we're clear there. So now Roger can annotate. So he drew a circle. As you can see, his is a different color. Um, so yep, Roger, that is correct. So if you repatch that there, we should be good. Um, Roger can also, uh, a lot of people use this, he can put his initials down here on the display to kind of confirm that, uh, okay, we had this conversation. He's signing off on this. So Roger, I appreciate that. If you'll repatch that cable, we'll be good. Give me a call back if you need some help, okay? 
or we'll do. So again, audio, video, I'm going on here. I'm gonna end the call now. Um, let me just give you an example. So there, there's the actual image that we just went through with Roger. That's stored up in the cloud platform, accessible uh, again for training, for, for records. Uh, we did not record that video, but if we had recorded, there would be a recording of that session. So again, a very uh, immersive platform. I think the annotation um, is one of the features that really helps connect people to what you're doing. So again, that session there could have taken 30, 45, an hour via email back and forth. We were able to do that quickly in a couple of minutes. And again, uh, also over a wide variety of connectivity. So that's kind of the platform as well. As I mentioned, uh, we won't be able to do the demo today, but uh, LibreStream also runs on the real world headgear. So think about a worker in a facility that's doing the same thing. Uh, now they can basically do a call with someone centric hands free. So their hands are free to do the work. Roger could have done that work right there as we were talking. So again, we can do demos of, of the whole LibreStream platform, a variety of the tools in the future today. Just reach out to us, let us know. Pete, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and we'll get into the Cambium presentation. Okay, I think we're good to go. Bruce Collins uh, from Cambium, if you could please uh, go forward, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, thanks, Gary. That was very cool stuff. That great demo and uh, nice look at the uh, at the lab environment there. Uh, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes. If you can go to the next slide and and talk a little bit about what Cambium is seeing a lot of these applications that just, we just saw there and throughout the innovation center lab there. Um, are really driving new requirements for connectivity. So uh, we talk about uh, really driving what used to be kilobits per second. We're now well into megabits per second. We're now talking about gigabits per second to the field. And so that's uh, really where we see the wireless technology going and really offering a, a, a faster return on investment and a faster time to deployment than fiber alternatives, but still that gigabit per second capacity. And really what's driving it is uh, in addition to all of the, the, um, the AR, VR, the machine learning, all those things that are latest and greatest. You've also got video surveillance, uh, security, as well as automation. Some of the applications you just saw there, uh, field craft access, um, and then even uh, some some of the uh, the remote workers that are out in the field being able to get access to uh, full capacity uh, back into the uh, in, into the, the back office. So all of those things are driving this new uh, need for higher capacity in the field, and that's an ongoing trend. What's exciting though is that there are some new technologies that have just emerged in the last couple. of years. Also, we see coming in the next couple of years that are really going to take that next step in capacity. Uh, so I've listed a few of them there over there on, on the right. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, uh, massive multi-user MIMO uh, from Cambium. That's a capability to deliver lots of capacity in the traditional five gigahertz band. Uh, we've extended that into the three and a half gigahertz band. Um, and we really see that as a sort of a a, uh, a ramp in the functionality and capabilities in those traditional bands. Uh, but there are some new bands coming as well. So you'll see references to Wi-Fi 6, which is a five gigahertz spectrum, but you'll also see references to Wi-Fi 6E, which is that new six gigahertz spectrum. That's gonna be 850 megahertz of new spectrum available in the US uh, when the FCC finalizes how the outdoor uh, capacity and capabilities are gonna work. Uh, we expect that to sort of start coming online from an FCC certification standpoint at the end of next year. Uh, and we will have products in both our EPMP product line as well as our PMP product line um, as we see that uh, that capability get turned on by the FCC. And again, look for that next year. And that's gonna be a bit of a land grab. It's gonna be 850 megahertz of new spectrum that you can deploy these applications and deliver uh, the, 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 the new 11AX chipsets and the new technology in that clean spectrum are gonna let us deliver gigabit per second over that, uh, that spectrum. Um, I'll touch on real briefly here because I wanted to go into a little more detail, but is 60 gigahertz millimeter wave. Uh, that, that whole market and ecosystem has really taken off in the last year. And I'll spend a little bit of time on that on the next slide. Uh, but we also look at private LTE solutions in that 2.5 and 3.5 gigahertz spectrum. And then of course, licensed microwave continues to evolve with uh, aggregation of multiple bands. So you can aggregate an 80 gigahertz spectrum, which gives you uh, lots of capacity up to uh, 20 gigabits per second. Um, you can aggregate that with your traditional 11, 18, 23 gigahertz spectrum, and you can aggregate those bands together and build up a high reliability, high availability, and high capacity link. 
all of these technologies are coming along pretty rapidly and starting to become a point where you can put that capacity wherever you need it in the field. If you go on to the next slide, I'll show you an example. Um, this is going to be an example of our uh, 60 gigahertz scene wave solution. And, and it kind of what we look at this as an alternative to laying fiber in, a, in an oil field, um, or if, whether you're doing um, um, active fields, or if you're in the exploration phase, um, you can get the connectivity out where you need it much more quickly and much more effectively and cost effectively than you can with fiber. And so this example is saying it's about 40% of the cost of fiber. Of course, it's even significantly lower cost if you don't have access to that fiber in that part of the, uh, that part of the world. So uh, this is an example of a 60 gigahertz solution where we have some uh, operators that are using this to deliver uh, high speed gigabit per second and they're using it to feed um, rig data that's coming off uh, for drilling operations. Uh, they have the, uh, the deck can trailers, the company trailers, and they're using E-band to inject that capacity out to the field, uh, which is 80 gigahertz. And then they're using uh, V-band, which is 60 gigahertz to distribute that signal around the oil pad in the, in the, in the drilling area. So you can get sort of that, uh, a couple mile radius uh, from where that last fiber node pop is, and you can start to distribute that signal and get lots of capacity. So uh, again, very quick time to deployment and very uh, uh, inexpensive when you compare trenching through an active oil field, um, much more effective way to, uh, to, to, to achieve those applications that you can see over at, that, the, at the Future Tech Innovation Center. So you can go on to the, to the last slide and I'll just wrap up on the Cambium section. We really look at, uh, a wireless fabric when we talk about the wireless uh, where things are going. So you can see that this chart is kind of busy, but there's a lot of, de a lot of depth to it. Um, you can see that as you go further out in range, you'll want to consider different spectrum uh, out to say 10 kilometers or more. Um, if you're able to get that injection out to the local area and then have uh, say, a, say a mile or so, uh, you can do lots of capacity in sort of uh, gigabits per second at, out to, a, out to a, a one or one and a half kilometers using a millimeter wave. And then all different, te different technologies in between, it's sort of a spectrum of distance, range, and density. And there's different spectrums and different technologies, depending on what you want to accomplish. You can also tile that together with switches or enterprise grade switches, as well as the uh, CN Maestro management system, which ties all that together into a single view that you can see what's happening uh, end to end. So uh, exciting times in the wireless space, lots of things coming. And uh, if you wanna learn more, you can certainly reach out to us and, and we can kind of walk you through uh, much more detail on each of these. And then if you wanna see it all playing together, of course you can reach out to Future Tech and see their, uh, at, the, at their innovation center, you can see how it all kind of ties together. So back to you, Pete. Hey, thanks Bruce. And to, to that point, we, we have on display there uh, Cambium's uh, Wi-Fi 6, uh, Cambium CN Wave. We, we constructed the two towers connected. We have some video uh, streaming between those, uh, which is gonna feed into this next demo on computer vision. But uh, definitely we, we could set up uh, follow-up sessions to get into more specifics around that. But let's, uh, let's spotlight uh, Gary. All right, can everybody see the spotlight? Yep. Okay, Gary, hey, uh, go ahead. Hey, thanks again. Thanks, Bruce. That was a, a good update from Cameo. So we're actually going to show some of the uh, cameras that we're using going over some of that connectivity. So we're going to do a computer vision. And we're really computer vision is about using, you know, video uh, photographs, any type of image to run into a computer model. And that model can then recognize things, actions, and then, and then trigger actions. So again, as I mentioned, we have a piece of software running on one of our edge compute uh, stacks back in the computer room. Uh, we're feeding that model through cameras here at our innovation center. So we're going to now actually go to the, to the user interface of that software and actually see live the cameras feeding into that model, that model being able to, to, to detect things. And then when it detects things, they can obviously email, text people for to take action. So Austin, let's go ahead and uh, kind of take a look at this. So, this is the interface into that computer vision software running on that edge compute stack. You notice we also have a camera here over uh, the display. Uh, that is basically that camera there is connected back to the edge stack via um, our CBRS in that network. So here's a modem we have that running into, it's running over the network. 
couple of the other cameras we have going over the sea and wave high speed link, as, as Bruce mentioned. So let's go ahead and click into uh, one of our uh, uh, use cases here. So let's, let's go into people counting. So, hey guys, you can maybe run. So, hey, uh, this is a model. This is actually streaming live over the Cambium C and Wave high speed wireless. So, again, uh, we've had companies that, hey, they want to do surveillance cameras out on their perimeter. They don't want to have to trench fiber. So, again, a great connection. So, again, you're seeing there is picking these people up, identifying. So, a, a people counting application. So, again, just one, one use case example a computer can know what people look like. Yeah, there's some false positives. Here's a great example of, hey, here on this. Uh, kind of uh, network uh, trailer thinks that's a person. Again, these have to be tuned, but generally pretty nice job of detecting people. So I can actually have it counting in the background on a timer, uh, feeding that into a database as well. Let's go back to another demo. So let me do the uh, face mask detection. So hey, guys, you come. So this is actually running off of this camera here at center stage. Uh, again, this is being light over, over the uh, CBRS network. As you can see, I'm red. Austin's kind of showing red. Hey guys, you could step up in the back. Um, Nino probably will start showing red. So yeah, this is a, a actually be able to take, is an individual wearing a face mask. So again, a pretty good use case for COVID. So uh, we keep going back and forth for your red. I'm gonna put my mask on and now I stay basically a solid green. Jake goes green. Nino's still flashing red. Roger's a solid green. So again, computer vision, it knows what a mask looks like. So we're doing a real time feed over the CBRS into that model. So again, here I could either do a video snippet of this, I could do an alert right to a database, a violation, kind of a what's going on here. Um, another use case too in, in manufacturing or industrial is using computer vision. Again, this would be using cameras already in place. These are IP-based cameras. This model is trying to detect, am I wearing my, my hard hat, my vest protection? So Again, uh, very quickly, just go into that. So again, think of in manufacturing, you've already probably got cameras out there. Hey, you know, you're asking your people to wear their, their safety gear, their PPE. Um, so this is a way to kind of have a model that can look at your environment, see if there are any violations. Um, so again, as I kind of step into this, you see it's trying to turn green around me and the other guys are staying red. So again, just another use case. So think of computer vision. If you can see it, you can think it, we can probably write a model to, to mimic on the computer. Uh, let me do one more model here. Here's an interesting one for lording detection. So uh, again, this is a model that is not doing facial recognition, but it, it knows what each of us kind of looks like. So this model has been set to, if it sees uh, images staying in an area for a certain time, I have it set very low, 15 seconds, and it basically turn red. So I'm gonna walk off the camera here. As I walk back on, it's going to think I'm a new individual. So I'm green. Okay, I'm good. Um, now, as, as the timer goes off, if I'm staying here for too long of a period of time, it's going to turn that uh, red. Then I can trigger. So the thing about lowering detection in a city or maybe even a manufacturing environment, an area where you don't want people standing around congregating. So again, just another kind of, I'd say, novel example, kind of the computer vision. Now, again, those are running over various types of uh, network connectivity. Um, we have another model here for uh, intrusion detection. Uh, we have our uh, equipment kind of back here today, but this is a model where we can actually draw, logically draw, virtually draw uh, images here. So this is at our back door. People step in these areas, it turns red, can basically trigger an alert to say that, hey, we have someone intruding into an area that we don't want them in. So in manufacturing, this could be a hazardous area that we can't put fencing around. Um, so again, as, as those gentlemen walk in there, you could see kind of that red trigger. So again, uh, there you go. So again, just an example of a creative use case for computer vision. So anybody have any questions on the computer vision use case, feel free to send those in. I'm gonna pivot over to another, another use case. So let's, so let's go over here. Hey, hey Gary, there's, there's no questions, but just to touch on what you described. So, you know, in, in this environment, we're trying to show multiple different forms of connectivity, wired, wireless, uh, you know, public cellular it, on the computer vision model, we're, we're going to be looking to leverage existing cameras as well as new cameras via different mediums of connectivity. And our goal is to show that here uh, because, you know, uh, most of the folks on this call have some form of network, have uh, different cameras deployed. The goal is for that to be an above the network type use 
of existing infrastructure. And then as you brownfield and move and add more infrastructure, that model can evolve with that. But uh, go, go ahead, Gary, if you could go into this next demo, that'd be great. Yeah, so we'll do one more use case, uh, very heavy industrial use case. Everyone's probably heard of predictive maintenance. And I say, how do you use these new emerging technologies to predict equipment failure? I know from manufacturers, from logistics firms, you know, unplanned downtime of an asset of a motor of a pump can be very expensive. It, it can cause safety issues. Um, as you know, hey, when a piece of equipment runs to failure, it's much more expensive to fix that equipment. It typically takes much longer to bring it back up. So this technology actually uses vibration sensors. So we're using uh, a sensor that basically does vibration and temperature over a wireless frequency. So this is gathering, it's, a, it's, it's got a magnetic base. You can put this on your, your motors. So here's an example of just a, a little rotating uh, bench motor we're doing here that we put it on to. So again, in a large, uh, say a paper mill where I came from, we might have 4,000 of these sensors monitoring all the rotating equipment across the facility. So it's basically real time gathering that vibration data off of that, that particular item. Uh, it's now communicating this over a proprietary um, frequency. Uh, again, it's proprietary, so it kind of stays off of your, your network, stays off of your Wi-Fi um, in a manufacturing market. But it does go back to this gateway here from the same company called KCF Technologies. So basically their gateway is then backhauling that data periodically out to their cloud service for the analytics. So here's an example of a multi-tech modem. This particular one, we're running public uh, sailors. We're on a Verizon card, pumping that back out to uh, the cloud service. This could be running over our private CBRS. It could be running over uh, C and Wave. So think again, we're, we're trying to show this, this connectivity could vary by customer depending on what they have in place. So again, a lot of flexibility backhauling this data out to the cloud service. So, I'm just kind of show you the user interface. Uh, Austin can go up there. So we've been running this motor for a period of time here. And we're here, we're only measuring two things. We're measuring overall vibration and temperature. So as you can see, the temperature is the green. Since we turn the motor on, the temperature's been rising. Um, it's kind of leveled off. We're at kind of like 90 degrees on the temperature. And the purple is the vibration pattern that we're sending. So again, it stayed pretty constant. Um, you know, here, when you come live, we can swap the pad on that motor off to throw uh, to throw basically in ballast onto the shaft and you can see the vibration go up real time. And then the platform can send email text messages to your technicians to let them know, hey, we're seeing a vibration spike. They can go out and do proactive maintenance on the equipment. So again, um, just uh, again, a pretty popular use case we're seeing in manufacturing and logistics. Um, and again, but having good connectivity to backhaul all that data out to your cloud provider is very, very important. So again, we have a lot of flexibility there. Um, Pete, I'm all throw it back to you. Yeah, Gary, one uh, one more thing, if you could show it at uh, center stage, just the uh, the Zebra uh, asset tracking scanner, just to quickly show that as a simple over the top application on the connectivity. Yeah, so here's a great example too. You know, in the market, we've talked about you know a lot of devices are native Wi-Fi, obviously wired, but we're seeing more and more end user devices starting to add native cellular, uh, private cellular capability. So this is the first. Zebra handheld, this is a, I think a TC26. So this actually has native CBRS connectivity. You can do Wi-Fi or CBRS. So running this over our private network, but basically a handheld scanner here. I can do barcode scanning. We have a uh, kind of a, a little, just a demo app running on the screen. So I can basically, here's a, a hive cell edge compute device. I got those barcoded. So I can now basically hit the database and I can bring that up, uh, go through the asset here, uh, check that out uh, to a customer. So again, just another kind of cool use case of, of, of this. We, we have a lot of clients doing handheld scanning. It's pretty popular in, in an industrial uh, warehouse, but uh, Wi-Fi coverage can also be a challenge. We have great coverage, have a few clients that get dead zones. So again, you may get better coverage in this in the future over a private cellular network. But again, this is an example of the market evolving, the ecosystem evolving, and now take advantage of this new connectivity that's kind of hitting uh, out of our customer locations. That's, that's great, Gary. I appreciate that. And, and that's another sure. example, like, you know, whether you have Wi-Fi, you're using that on Wi-Fi, public cellular, private cellular, we want to provide basically the, the ability to test these different things before they go into production. Uh, so appreciate you, you uh, overviewing that, Gary. Um, if we go back to the Thank slides, uh, I'm going to um, remove the spotlight. We'll go back to the slides. And I think up next is our, is our presenter. So I'll, I'll defer to Jaime to uh, present his slides from Nokia. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Pete. And uh, well, now I have the power. If you are an 80s kid, you will get the reference. But uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Pete and, and Future Check for giving me this opportunity to, to talk again back at Entelec. I am very excited that we are quite uh, familiar with Entelec and uh, we always participate. So it's always good to, to be back and, and presenting. So let me go through the slides. Uh, so uh, for, for Nokia and you, uh, what you have been hearing today is quite similar. Is the same feedback that we we are receiving from the oil and gas industry, right? We are talking about a, a full ecosystem, right? We are go talking about smart networks and smart devices. And as you can see in this in this slide, we are always talking about these concepts that are very valid today, very current. And now we, as, as we saw also in the, during the Intel presentation, we need to, to, to talk about beyond connectivity as well, right? We are always talking about networks, the devices, but also now we need to incorporate what the cloud can bring uh, as a benefit, how the uh, different uh, analytics or intelligence software is going to help us to uh, really uh, uh, get the full potential of what we are presenting today uh, for you guys. But also another important aspect that we need to highlight is the environment itself, right? Oil and gas industry, we are always talking about hazardous environments, uh, very remote sites, obviously starting from offshore facilities to even temporary sites, construction stages or construction phases, moving into a port, moving into a refinery, moving into a pipeline that will go into uh, a lot of uh, control, uh, process control and uh, instrumentation. So we also need to acknowledge that besides the, uh, let's say, intelligent uh, solutions that we can uh, present here today, we, we also need to consider how the environment is and how all this technology is going to be applied for the specific use cases that the industry is going to be requesting, right? We are, we are hearing a lot of uh, good uh, products today, a good, of, uh, a good uh, solutions as well, but uh, all this needs to work uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, let's say, as a team, right? It's an, a really end-to-end -end solution. And that's exactly one of the concepts that Nokia is helping uh, in this, uh, what we now call this digital transformation, right? Is is more about uh, selecting the right technology for the right uh, environment, but also select the right uh, technology for the specific use case. And, and for Nokia, it's very, let's say, easy to position a box, right? But here we need to think more about how we can deliver an end-to-end -end service enablement and most important, how we can do this in a very secure ma manner. Not only talking about physical security, but also about cyber security, which is an important aspect that now we are hearing quite often uh, uh, with, with our conversation with customers. So uh, as you can see in this slide, and, and we have been hearing from, from my colleagues, during this, this hour is, is about uh, private networks, uh, private wireless solutions, but also there are other components that we need to be aware. Uh, we were also, we, we were hearing about uh, the backhaul that sometimes is, is very well forgotten, right? But besides that, we need to move the, 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 let's say the solution or the discussion in how these pieces are going to interact also uh, beyond the connectivity pay, uh, space, right? So that's why we now, uh, talk about uh, uh, analytics, uh, asset intelligence, uh, how we can help manage everything from one single pane of glass. And this is a little bit of a summary of uh, what we have been uh, uh, talking today, right? But uh, this is part of uh, also what Nokia can present as part of an end-to-end -end solution, right? That goes beyond the connectivity piece. And, and also uh, to consider that uh, this future of oil and gas or this transformation that is happening today they will need to continue evolving, right? And uh, again, uh, considering the environment, considering the assets that we now need to connect, we need to start doing a kind of a roadmap of solutions and how different customers will be, let's say, interested in different things, but at the end with a final objective of maybe getting a full automated site, uh, connecting all the instrumentation, consolidating all the different uh, industrial protocols that they are already using, trying to 
transport this data not only to the uh, let's say to the site but beyond the site uh, uh, to the headquarters to the data centers trying to interconnect all the uh, different elements and also thinking in safety as a priority as well so uh, the way we see as, as Nokia uh, the digital transformation that is, is going to go beyond the connectivity. We are connecting assets, we are connecting workers with different technologies, right? We are deploying this in remote sites, offshore sites, uh, refineries, ports, etc. And at the, at the same time, we need to start discussing about use cases, right? What is really going to drive this uh, implementation is going to be the actual use cases. And we cannot, uh, let's say, put everybody in the same uh, uh, page saying that you need to go for a full automated site from day one. No, the idea is to have a a uh, case by case discussion to see what are the priorities, what are the pain points, what are the challenges that the oil and gas uh, uh, companies is facing today, and how we can put all the pieces together. And and this also is very helpful uh, working together with Future Tech and and the rest of uh, of my colleagues in this call is to exactly as as have been mentioned, how we can put an end to end solution and and testing and validating all the different applications that can be deployed deployed and make this an end-to-end -end solution. So that's that's the future of oil and gas is beyond the connectivity, following uh, uh, the interoperability of different applications, having a safety as a priority and take this forward to the future, right? Uh, uh, under the concept of uh, private wireless, which is the trending topic today, uh, we are hearing a lot of uh, Wi-Fi, we are hearing a lot about LTE, but eventually we need to talk about 5G and, and believe it or not, uh, not Nokia is already working and uh, developing 6G. I, I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but we need to start thinking about the evolution of private wireless and the interoperability of other technologies that will extend the benefits and features of a private wireless environment up all the way to other applications. So just to conclude, uh, uh, I just want to show what the, we call the future X architecture for oil and gas. Uh, this is a, a, a theory uh, that has been developed by Nokia Bell Labs, our research and development, but is more intended to look into the whole concept, right? Because we cannot just talk about connectivity. Obviously, is the base. We need to start with a high performance network, which will combine different technologies. But then we need to start climbing a little bit the ladder uh, to think about what things can need to be in the edge, what things need to be going to a cloud. Obviously, the concept of a distributed edge and hybrid cloud are already there. So we now need to start connecting all the pieces, looking into the digital value platform, right, where we are going to look into industrial automation, analytics, digital operations, and expanding up uh, uh, this up uh, again in the ladder for the business applications, right? Where the real, uh, let's say, importance of uh, uh, the, the attention of the oil and gas customers is at on, right? How I can do my work more efficient, how I can increase safety, how I can optimize my assets, right? So all those business applications definitely need to be considered in order to achieve a, a really end-to-end and digital transformation. So uh, just to conclude and uh, and uh, and again giving uh, thanks to to Future Tech, uh, you heard that we have a private uh, LTE solution in in the in the Innovation Center of Future Tech that has been tested with different applications. That's exactly the collaboration that we are doing, and we want to take this to uh, obviously uh, uh, different levels, right? By starting to put. Uh, local edge computing, more applications on the edge and, and start to pull this uh, for business applications as I am explaining in this lab, in this slide, sorry. Uh, at the end, uh, what we are trying to achieve is this uh, global architecture that uh, starts with connectivity, but goes all the way to uh, the value creation together with business applications. Uh, so uh, I will stop there. I, I try to be brief uh, uh, and, and, and just to provide a little bit of context of what Nokia together with Future Tech and the rest of, the, of our colleagues in the call are offering. So uh, I am giving you the microphone back to you, Pete, uh, in order Hello. to continue. 
That's that's great. Thank you very much. Great information. And just to just to touch on that, we have the private cellular system there. That's 4G. And in the background, what we're manufacturing there today is actually 5G mm -hmm. uh, NSA portable systems that are going to be deployed in in range environments. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, demonstrating what's possible today, demonstrating what's possible in the future in collaboration with Nokia. Um, transitioning on we're gonna the next presenter uh michael is from uh skyward they've got a uh, platform as a service that uh, helps enable uh, uh safe drone deployment so i'm gonna hand this off to, to michael thanks for joining us michael and uh, appreciate your contribution thanks pete uh as pete said my name is mike danielic i'm with skyward and i'm going to talk about how the oil and gas industry is using drones and but first i'm going to talk a little bit about drones overall in the enterprise and how they're regulated and how we help customers. Uh, so next slide. So it's been said that as soon as a drone lifts off to the height of a blade of grass, it's in the national airspace and it's subject to FAA rules. So that all of a sudden brings in a lot of federal regulations, just the way OSHA applies and other federal regulations apply to how we work. Uh, what we do is we help customers start up or scale up or innovate within their drone programs so that they can be compliant with those regulations, but then they're also productive in the field. So one of the first products that we have uh, along those lines is our drone management platform. So this allows the pilots that are flying the drones to know what the airspace is and I'll, and I'll talk about the platform and a little bit more in a second but it gives it talks about airspace and, and um, the fact that we can get drone pilots access to controlled airspace we have a link with the faa that will tell the faa that this is a particular drone plans on flying in this particular location at this date and time and, and then we provide some other tools as part of that um, we also provide consulting and training so as I mentioned, we help our customers uh, stand up or scale up a program. So what that would involve is actually giving uh, corporate policies and procedures that apply that that uh, uh, an enterprise can, you know, put in place. You know, we're talking about taking customers from zero aviation experience and zero knowledge about this particular area, and by the time we've helped them and we leave that they have a fully functioning and productive and compliant drone program. So that requires these general operating manuals, standard operating procedures and checklists, things like that. And we also will come on site and do training. So it, for a pilot to get their drone license from the FAA, they just need to study and take a written test without ever having uh, had their heads on a drone. And so we will actually come and train uh, pilots for an enterprise or train their trainers so that they can be self-sustaining and do their own training after we're done. But we also provide aircraft and hardware uh, for select models. Uh, we don't make drones ourselves, but we work with drone OEMs. Uh, we work with them on connectivity, uh, which is the last column. You know, we, we believe that future drones uh, are going to be connected via LTE because it gives a more reliable signal. It's, a, it's operating on spectrum that's protected by the FCC, uh, unlike Wi-Fi, which most drones fly on today, which is subject to a lot of interference, especially in cities. Uh, and then we also kind of combine these last two. So we've worked with an OEM. Uh, we just announced pricing availability for the Nafi AI drone, which is a, the first production um, LTE connected drone. And so we're pretty excited about that, which is going to give our customers new capabilities. Okay, next slide. So this is a little bit more about our drone management platform. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, we allow the pilots or whoever's managing pilots to actually uh, give them tools to plan their flight. So to do to get access to uh, an airspace map that will show them, uh, the, you know, an airspace can be uh, fairly complex. I'm a private pilot, uh, but, you know, drone pilots don't need to see 
anything above 500 feet above the ground. So we show them what the airspace looks like below 500 feet and where they need to get special permission from the FAA in order to fly or where they're free to fly and, and what the rules are. Uh, we allow them to plan those flights, uh, to assess that in advance by giving them 3D views of the terrain and, and buildings in the area, uh, showing them where obstructions are, where power lines might be, that sort of thing. So it's a planning tool, but then we also provide a tool to fly. So uh, I don't know how well you can see over the webinar, but that center screen is really a view of our mobile app while a drone is flying. And so the entire picture is the main camera view coming back on the drone is this particular drone uh, looks like it's flying down the Willamette River in Portland, Oregon, where uh, Skyward's base, but you'll see annotations around the screen giving the pilot various information about the drone. When uh, our customers are using our app to fly, we also provide real time telemetry back to the pro, uh, to the platform so that uh, other people can see exactly where that drone is and where it's going. Uh, and we also provide uh, the log files from that drone so that you can go back after the fact and see where that drone was and what height it was uh, at what time and you know where it was flying and accumulate that data so we log the time against the pilot the drone and the battery and then lastly our platform also allows processing of data so you can go up and take uh, plan an area that you want to fly and the drone will fly a pattern across that area and take hundreds of images which our platform will stitch together and create 2D and 3D models that could be used for surveys, for measurements, for volumetric measurements. So if there's stockpiles uh, that we can, you can just, once you do these, uh, create these models, you could just go in with your cursor and highlight a stockpile and we'll tell you what the volume of that pile is. Uh, next, next slide. So now let's talk about specifically you know, how drones are being used in the oil and gas vertical. In, in fact, rather than read, you know, some of these specific examples, what I'd like to do is kind of categorize these uh, into like three different areas. The first is, uh, and, and I think one of the more interesting has to do with gas leak detection. And there's a couple ways of doing that that are being used today. One is to use a specialized camera that's tuned to uh, particular frequencies and absorption frequencies of gases like methane. And so these are really great for detecting leaks and you know, where methane is normally invisible, flying a drone over a particular area, let's say you know, some infrastructure, you, if there's a leak there, you will be able to see that escaping gas plain as day you know, in that camera. And it, it, it's, it's phenomenal how well that works. We also have some customers that are actually adding sniffers to the drones themselves to find an area. And so, especially for pipelines, a lot of people may not realize, but the amount of gas that gets pushed into a pipeline is not the amount of gas that comes out at the other end. And whether oil companies are doing this themselves or they're hiring specialized drone service providers, they need to find those leaks because, you know, number one, they're dangerous. Number two, it's lost product. And they're very, very successful. It's, it's like, you know, using a drone in that use case is like, you know, owning a money machine and uh, they're phenomenal paybacks for those. So those are, that's one interesting thing in differentiating about the oil and gas market. The other is about how they're pushing the envelope. So again, with pipelines, they have long linear infrastructure and drones are very useful for flying that infrastructure to assess the condition, to map it, to survey it, to look for encroaching vegetation to look for encroaching homeowners in rural areas that somebody may, you know, encroach on the right away of the pipeline and they need to know about that or provide security. And then lastly, they have the same use cases as other uh, large enterprises. So for example, uh, inspecting equipment uh, while it's operating, you know, even picture a flare stack, um, you know, you couldn't, those need to be inspected but to normally be inspected, you have to shut things down in order to put a person there to do that inspection. But with a drone, you don't need to do that. And that applies to all the, you know, you, all the equipment you might find at a refinery or in, in other places. So that's really interesting. The other, uh, I've talked to refineries that employ drones for incident response. 
And so what they'll do is, is part of their incident response is they put up a drone because, you know, and this is where fixed cameras don't work as well because you don't know where this incident is going to occur. And even if you did have some fixed cameras, it's always nice to have a different view or an aerial view so you can plan how you're going to respond and, and plan that in real time. And so streaming is very important and you'll see some announcements from us uh, in Q1 next year about our streaming capabilities. And then other uh, use cases like instruction, monitoring, uh, in progress, environmental uh, assessment, things like that. Okay, uh, next slide. So I just wanted to hire a case study. This Skyscopes is a customer of ours that uses uh, drones in the oil and gas market, uh, although they're not an oil and gas company themselves. And so uh, one of the interesting things about the drone industry is how has it evolved? how it's evolved over time. It started out where there were, it was very complicated. And of course, Skyward has helped make that easy. Uh, but there, there were drone service providers flying for companies and providing them the data. Now, as um, the part 107 rules made things simpler from the FAA, is companies like Skyward have made things easier for companies to adopt their own drone programs. We've lowered the cost for them to run their own programs, made it more flexible, and gave them new capabilities. And so what now you've seen is this evolution where companies will still have their internal programs, and then they may go outside to a company like Skyscopes for either, um, let's say, to handle uh, uh, increased workload, or in you know, let's say there's a, a hurricane in the Gulf, and there's a lot of damage that needs to be assessed, uh, those companies, while having their own internal pilots and assets, will also rely on external drone service providers to also, in a temporary basis, to come in and fly for them. Uh, and companies like Skyscopes will like our program for that and our platform because it's how they demonstrate to their other customers that they have a safe, compliant program. Because they could go into our program, point to all the data they've collected, point to the number of hours they have, the types of missions, the types of flights, and their pilots and the pilots background, and it's all right there. And it helps them make their case that, you know, we're a safe, reliable operator that you can trust on our network. So that's what I have to say about drones. I'd be glad to answer questions later and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Pete. Hey, thanks, Mike. Exciting stuff. Uh, the platform is really a great tool to enable uh, the end clients to safely deploy their drone program and then having the uh, connectivity bundled in, exciting announcement with the uh, connected drone. So uh, we're looking forward to a great year next year together partnering. Uh, but this brings us to our, our last panelist. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Sierra Wireless uh, is going to discuss, uh, they're, they're at an interesting point of, of inflection where you have public network connectivity, private network connectivity. So I'm going to hand this off. Uh, to Brian and uh, go ahead, Brian. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna start out, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit different direction than some of our other presenters have been going today. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff on new, uh, amazing technology developments, but I'm going to start, I'm going to go back a little bit. And the, the message I want to tell is something to do with where Sierra Wireless has been, where we're coming from, and where we're going in the future. Uh, talk about the uh, industry as it has been built up. Uh, Sierra has been in business for more than 25 years. We are in a situation now where uh, a lot of the first in this industry were things that were developed to come from Sierra Wireless, the first uh, cellular module de deployed, first embedded software platform, uh, embedded SIM deployment, cellular module, a uh, first LTE module. Uh, I started back into the wireless industry from Wireline in 2007. And the first thing presented to me as I was a sales engineer for Verizon was a AirLink. 1X device, and then an AirLink 3G device. And then as the market matured, other companies came in and took Sierra chipsets and built 1X devices and 3G devices, but Sierra always led the market. Then in 2010, when LTE was introduced to the market, the first devices available for LTE were Sierra devices, Sierra GX devices. These devices were the workhorse for the energy industry, and they are deployed all over the world. 
uh, these devices are out there. Uh, as Sierra developed more application processors, not only sped up how the device operated, but also allowed the devices to uh, do VPNs a lot more effectively and things like that. Uh, open source development platform for IoT, that was another place that we went. Uh, LT advanced modules, this aggregated multiple carriers and devices and gave a lot more wireless backup. Uh, open hardware reference design, uh, and then we got into our low power industrial gateways. These are deployed all over the world in the oil and gas industry. Uh, one of our more popular products. Uh, when we started getting into mobility, we were the first to uh, announce uh, multi-port LT advanced uh, mobility devices. These are also used in a lot of area where we need more ports and more situations. Uh, I did kind of bring an old slide in, but this particular slide tells a lot about where Sierra is going. Keep in, and I keep talking further, I talk about uh, CBRS. We led the development in CBRS. We uh, in 5G right now, uh, Sierra has multiple 5G products on the market. And most of our competition that has 5G products on the market are embedding Sierra modules in those devices. So Sierra is leading in 5G as well. Uh, next slide. We lead in a lot of uh, deployments. Uh, many of the top 10 oil and gas producers rely on Sierra. These are existing devices. These are new devices. Uh, our technology has, has really, uh, really changed the oil and gas industry, and we're getting more and more into that as well. Uh, EMS providers, uh, transit agencies, police departments, still a lot, of, many of them use Sierra wireless devices. Uh, Sierra wireless is led in band 14. Band 14 is also known as FirstNet. FirstNet is, uh, is something that is now available to the uh, oil and gas industry and Sierra wireless supports FirstNet very well. Again, we also are very big in CBRS, we're very big in 5G, and we're leading the market in a lot of these industries. Next slide. The energy industry, wellheads, processing, compressor, Sierra devices are all over in all of these areas, RTUs, uh, distribution. Uh, also, we're finding with a lower latency of 5G, we're finding a lot more primary connectivity is being used as well. And Sierra is, is very heavily invested in 5G. We're leading the market in 5G and we create a lot of the modules that other carriers, other devices are using as well as Sierra devices. So, uh, and then I will be, last slide, I will be ready for questions when you have direct questions in uh, uh, the next stage. Great. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, so that concludes our uh, panel for today. Uh, what we will do is take the uh, raw video feed and we'll post process that and eliminate some of the, uh, the idle time that we had early. Uh, and we'll repost that uh, on our YouTube channel, as well as Entelec will be reposting that on their side. Uh, 